Hi, everyone, and welcome to VMware Partnership Perspectives. I'm Kathleen Tandy, Vice President of Global Partner and Alliance Marketing at VMware, and I'm pleased to bring you the stories from our VMware partners, executives, and industry analysts. This week, you'll be listening to Paul Saville, Senior Vice President, Strategy, Alliances, and Technology Services at Lumen Technologies. Together, we'll discuss the power of the edge computing ecosystem and how Lumen and VMware's expanded partnership and combined capabilities enable customers to deliver future forward experiences. Let's start now. Paul, thanks so much for joining me today on our podcast. Hi, Kathleen. It's great to be here. So, Paul, for those who may not be familiar with Lumen, can you give us a quick overview of Lumen Technologies, the customers and markets that you serve, what's Lumen Technologies' special sauce, and how you work with VMware? So, Lumen is a global communications company that's also a technology company. I actually think we're a bit of a unique animal in the the enterprise world because we kind of straddle both worlds. And I I sometimes refer to us as a net tech company because of that. But on the one side, we own and operate a global communications network that involves around 450,000 fiber route miles of network that spans pretty much every corner of the United States several subsea cable systems across the Atlantic, down to South America, across the Pacific. Our networks reach into Europe and cover most of Europe, cover most of Latin America, and then the pack rim. From that network, we provide a variety of services that involve everything from traditional voice type services to more modern unified communications collaboration services. We're one of the world's largest public internet service providers. We have all kinds of uh, data communication services. And then as we kind of go up the stack, we actually have a number of technology services. And that's part of the group that I manage around helping customers adopt new technologies, participate in the fourth industrial revolution. This organization is really about helping customers to take these technologies like cloud services combined with cloud networking capabilities with application migrations to the cloud, running their valuable digital assets in a way that is optimized for performance. And that's one way to think about what our company does is that I sometimes like to summarize it by by saying that our business is about taking customers' valuable digital assets and moving them where they need to be around the world in a safe and secure manner and connecting them up with high-performance networking so that they can perform the best they can and then removing them when they don't need to be there anymore. And so when you think about it, valuable digital assets can be a lot of things. It can be things like even a telephone call in today's world can be a valuable digital asset, but the databases that need to be moved around, critical information that needs to be acted on that needs to be moved around the world, but also applications are valuable digital assets that enterprise customers have. And that's a big part of our strategy and what we do for our customers. So two things that you mentioned, I want to double click on. One is the fourth industrial revolution and then applications, those valuable digital assets. Let's focus on the fourth industrial revolution because I think if people, and I encourage everybody listening to go to Lumen's website, lumen.com, and learn more about this amazing company, but it's not necessarily your typical headline that you would see from a technology company. Today, it says edge computing for the fourth industrial revolution. I've read about it. I'm sure our listeners have. But for Lumen, that's a really unique way to present your company and your business. Why a focus on the fourth industrial revolution? Yeah, that's a great question. When you think about the progression of industrial revolutions, there was the first, the second, the third, and the fourth. The third industrial revolution that some people may be familiar with was around computation, around the invention of the computer and processing power. But there was another side of that industrial revolution, which was about communications technology and about the build out of the global public internet and about the connectedness that we have of networks now that span everywhere that enable people to talk to each other and computers to talk to each other the way that never happened before. That was the third industrial revolution. And Lumen actually played a major role in the third industrial revolution because of our role that we have in the public internet space. And today we're the largest public internet service provider across the world. There's a very large percentage of the packets of any data that travels through the internet actually passes through the Lumen network on its way to get to where it needs to be. And so as we were looking at our evolving role in helping enterprises achieve their objectives, and we started seeing what was going on with the fourth industrial revolution, we started to see that 
we have a significant role to play in the fourth industrial revolution as well. And the fourth industrial revolution is characterized by things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and Internet of Things. It's these new smart technologies that are being rolled out that are just enabling the next world of fantastic inventions. I just think about how in my lifetime, you can tell from, well, we can see each other, but I have a gray beard. And so you can tell from my gray beard that in my my wizened years of experience that I started my career when there wasn't even really a public internet, when there wasn't cell phones, when there were no laptops. And we progressed so much in that past you know, 20, 30 years. Even you take what the technology we have today, like you know, this iPhone I've got sitting right beside me, if you would have shown me that when I started my career in 1990, I would be like, what the heck is that? You know, it's like, yeah. it's yeah. amazing. It's magical. You know, the things that we're going to see from the fourth industrial revolution are going to completely blow us away again. Sometimes I talk to young people coming out of college and I just tell them I'm, I'm jealous of them because of what they're going to experience over the course of their lifetimes with this fourth industrial revolution technology that's going to enable so many amazing things. And that's how we started to tie it back to Lumen. That's how we started thinking about our company saying, what is this role? Do we have a role to play in the fourth industrial revolution? And we realize that we do. These applications that are powered by AI and these fascinating tools, they're part of that story of needing to be distributed around the world and connected extremely well to all of the things that they need to connect to. And IoT is a great example of that, about the millions and billions of devices that are growing so rapidly that need to collect data, that data needs to be acted on, and decisions need to be made with that data. And that needs to happen so fast, so much faster than has ever happened before. And we realize at Lumen that because of our capabilities around edge compute and our cloud expertise and our application management expertise and this great network that ties it all together, that we play a role in supporting that. I'm glad you brought up Edge, Paul, because the corollary to the fourth industrial revolution is Lumen roots that in Edge, Edge computing for the fourth industrial revolution. And I was going to ask you why such a strong focus on Edge? I mean, that's declaring the focus of the company as being really rooted in Edge. Why particular that aspect of the whole breadth of the technology space and what particularly is Lumen looking to bring to customers from a value standpoint in a focus on the edge? So as you think about applications and data, in this fourth industrial revolution, they're going to become more and more distributed. Compute is becoming more and more distributed. Compute is turning up everywhere. It's in IoT devices for sure, but people understand that. We've got computers that are running around and every car has, has computers now that are connected through networks. Your wearables for your health is basically another computer. Someday it could be in our clothes. It'll be in our items in our refrigerator and so on. And so all of these things, they need to be connected and they need to communicate with each other. The reason that Lumen is emphasizing this is because when we looked at the role that we could play in the fourth industrial revolution, we saw the need for what's emerging with edge compute and how edge compute is the technology is advancing around the space, particularly VMware playing a very big role there with Tanzu in terms of the new software and control technologies enabling distributed compute to manage applications and communicate between applications no matter where they are. But to make edge compute really work, you need a few things. First of all, you need digital or you need distributed data centers and edge compute locations that can operate at scale that's widely distributed. Lumen has those data centers. So as a communications company, we have over 3,000 basically little mini data centers already spread across the world that we own and operate. The thing is that those little mini data centers, we didn't call them data centers in the old days. We called them gateways and central offices and things like that. But what's happened over the years is that the equipment in those facilities has shrunk because technology has enabled us to do that in a much smaller space. But what we were left with, with a lot of technical facilities that are basically bulletproof, that are very power dense, that have great diverse fiber connectivity into them. And so as we looked at the, all this distributed real estate and technical space, we said, well, we meet criteria one because we have all of this distributed space around where we can create very reliable edge compute nodes that can operate very cost effectively. The other thing that you need is high performance networking. And when you think of Lumen's network and the reach that it has across that span that I talked about earlier, the ability to connect in a variety of ways things together, either through the public internet, through wireless connectivity, through dedicated private networking. Lumen has all of that capability because 
we have that kind of reach. And when we started looking at our footprint and our reach, we were actually surprised. We surprised ourselves because we had never done this analysis, but we said, we reached 98% of the enterprises in the U.S. Wow. within our fiber footprint within just a few milliseconds of latency. And so we have the reach, the global reach, and the reach into the metropolitan areas to really provide that high-performance networking. And then when customers want to go through the public internet, we also can provide optimized networking because we are so deeply interconnected with all of the different internet service providers that more deeply interconnected than any other carrier in the world then we are more likely to be able to provide a higher performance connection through the public internet than any other entity. The third thing that you need is the ability to orchestrate. It's great if you have data centers, it's great if you have high performance networking, but if you don't have the ability to take these next gen fourth industrial revolution applications and databases and orchestrate their distribution effectively and easily, then you can't really help enterprise customers much. And this is actually where VMware really comes into play and why we chose VMware to create an alliance. We saw this opportunity, we said, we need somebody like VMware to build out this orchestration capability. And then the last thing is you need a managed services wrapper because the enterprises that we talk to, they're really overwhelmed by all of the things that they have to pull together. All of those software decisions, all of the hardware decisions, the infrastructure decisions, the networking decisions, that managed technology services group that is part of my responsibility really plays that role of looking what the customer is trying to solve for, what technology problem that they are trying to achieve or, or goals they have, and make it all sense. You know, put it together in a way that really makes sense and helps them make those decisions. Or if they just want to buy a turnkey solution from us, they don't have to worry about all those decisions. We'll do that for them and deliver the service in a way that they don't have to be encumbered by all of that. So that's why Lumen really felt like we had a role to play here in the fourth industrial revolution. Well, and edge computing and Paul, you sold me. I'm just really struck by it sounds like, although, and I love the fact that you said Lumen kind of, we, we surprised ourselves. It sounds like the evolution of from what was former CenturyLink with other companies that have come together to form Lumen Technologies has really put you all, you have the right foundation at the right place in the right time kind of in the evolution of history. And I want to talk more about actually managed services and the increasing role we're seeing with customers' interests. But before we do that, I did want to focus a little bit on your comments about VMware, because I know that we have, people listening may not know, but recently, Lumen and VMware, we have deepened our relationship. We have deepened our joint focus. We've been great partners for years in the past, but we've taken that up to a new level. I know we have a number of very exciting joint initiatives planned around a couple of key technology areas, but I was hoping that you could tell our listeners more about what do we have planned and in store together, and what are the key areas that we're focusing on in our new expanded joint initiatives? First and foremost, VMware does play a major role in, the, in our services, as you said, for a long time. We've been a cloud services provider for quite a while, and particularly we didn't do too well against Amazon and Microsoft and Google in the public cloud services space, but we did all right on the private cloud services space. As we started looking at this opportunity around edge compute, we had choices. We had other choices on, on a way to go on in terms of the architectures that we built to support the edge compute piece. In the end, after taking an evaluation of it, we felt like VMware was the best company to partner with to help us build out our edge compute platform. And as a result of that, a big part of our roadmap is around rolling out managed VMware services that can be deployed on the edge. A simple way to think about it was that what we're trying to achieve is that we want existing VMware customers that may be working in their own private environments or using some of the capabilities of VMware in the public clouds to be able to use their same VMware tools to say, oh, well, now I have another landing spot that I can use my existing VMware tools to deploy through the Lumen network applications much closer to my office locations because Lumen's edge compute platform is completely compatible with VMware and with the tools that I use today. And that's one of the things that we're deploying now. And we just think that it's great for VMware and it's great for Lumen because with VMware now, it gives you guys the opportunity to expand, to give your customers another way to expand out. And it's great for us because the compatibility that we have with your customers, it makes our Edge platform that much easier for them to consume and use. So we benefit from it that way. 
But another whole area that we're doing, and by the way, that first part, it expands as well with the things that you all are doing with Tanzu and managed Kubernetes and helping customers adopt container-based technologies to do this. We're working with you together to make it really easy for customers to adopt that next generation of technology and use their VMware tools to deploy across the world just very, very easily. But another whole separate dimension that we're working together on is around the work that you're doing with some of your acquisitions with Velo Cloud and with Carbon Black, this move toward SASE, Secure Access Service Edge technology. Lumen is a, a large VPN service provider today. We're the third largest in the U.S. Our SD-WAN services are growing very rapidly like most companies. And we recently added Velo Cloud as part of this alliance structure to our portfolio. What we plan to do, though, is that as VeloCloud kind of starts to merge into SASE and SASE starts bringing components of carbon black and security capabilities, that type of architecture, that, that type of networking actually works very well, even better on a very distributed platform. And that's where we think that there's another opportunity for our two companies, because we believe that by deploying those types of services on a highly distributed basis over Lumen's edge compute across the world, that in giving customers an easy way to dispatch those assets and manage those assets across this platform, that is a way that we can deliver much higher performing, much more secure networks that can be turned up on the fly and delivered wherever they need to in the world. And that's another major initiative that we're working on with VMware. Yeah, I'm glad you raised security. If you hadn't brought it up, I was going to bring it up in terms of the joint initiatives. But I think before, as you were talking about even the different components of being able to help drive edge computing, how Lumen is well positioned, you brought up the topic of security, of helping to ensure that that very distributed ability to move valuable digital assets around the world, one of the key ways is being able to do that securely with confidence, particularly as they cross geographic boundaries, because there's so much concern by customers about being able to have data centers and information and data security within certain boundaries. How are you particularly interested or what do you think VMware's Carbon Black solution uniquely helps contribute to Lumen's ability to ensure that you're able to do all of this in a secure way, because we all know customers are increasingly concerned about, I mean, security is top of mind. Every day we're seeing hacking news, things being held hostage. It is becoming a, a nightmare for a lot of companies. So how is this uh, going to position you guys to deliver even greater customer value from a security standpoint? Yeah, so it's in a couple of dimensions. One, going back to several years ago, basically we used to think about security in terms of locations. We would wall off a location with security and make sure that we had firewalls deployed that were physical, that were in those spots that would screen all of the data and look at things that coming in and out. That has changed dramatically over the last few years because we become such a mobile workforce and we have to communicate to so many different endpoints back and forth that we've got to adapt with the technology to get out of that mindset and be able to provide security solutions in a way that are not dependent upon pieces of hardware or software that's actually based on a physical location that is based at a physical presence. That's part of how we see Carbon Black and your security services really helping us because of the proactive analytical tools that are used that don't require that anymore, that allow us to watch endpoints based upon their IP address and the activities that predict behavioral patterns that give us an indication and high levels of confidence that as a secure user or an acceptable user coming in and accessing certain information. Those are some of the tools that are there that really are the next generation type of capabilities. The second thing is the incorporation and building in that into just the fundamental aspects of the networking services that we provide. There's been this whole kind of transition from, I mean, I go back to, you know, like Ethernet or private line days and then IPVPN was really the big hot stuff to get rid of ATM and frame relay. But all of those are kind of fixed circuit type of solutions. And it's a lot easier to control security when you have a closed physical barrier <laughs> that's involved sure. like an IPVPN. But that has changed rapidly. We did the advent of SD-WAN services really coming forward and moving along over the last few years. That has taken that physical part of the security piece and it's blown it up. So this concept that we can't count on physical borders anymore to help or physical borders in the OSI stack to help us with security is another element and dimension of this that your carbon black and security solutions help us to address. 
That's great. Yeah, I think you just touched on so many of different topics that our customers and even extended mutual partners working with customers are thinking about in terms of all of the risks and the broader cross boundary ability to have connectivity, move everything around has a lot of upsides, but you just radically increase your surface area for risk. And so really appreciate your summary and description of uniquely how you see our security solutions being able to help address that. I had mentioned before, I wanted to talk about managed services and I want to talk about managed services also with the shift that I know Lumen is seeing with customers and we are seeing, which is the whole market and our mutual customers wanting to shift to how they purchase technology. So we are seeing a broad shift to consumption-based purchase models as the technology allows it. So shift to SaaS, to subscription, but also to managed services. And I know that those shifts are also something that our extended partners are looking at. I think every partner that we work with and you work with them as well are thinking about how do we either buy or build managed services into our business. And I think that is going to be the future foundation of how partners work with customers. But I think it's also connected to this whole shift to more of a consumption-oriented purchasing model. You, as you're leading services for Lumen, what do you see as the key drivers from customers, the key things that's fueling this shift and this drive? And then how are you looking to lead this for Lumen and helping deliver greater value? And where do you see this taking Lumen and their partnership with customers in the future? Boy, there's a lot to unpack there in that question. (laughs) I'll try to get it done here. There's a couple of components of what you spoke to there. One is the kind of on-demand type of capabilities that people want to just consume what they want when they want it. And then there is the overall managed services wrapper and why people are tending toward that. And so I'll speak to the first one if I break it down in that way a little bit. Again, I like to look back at history to provide context for where we are today. In the old days, companies like ours liked to sell things that had a long term on them that were fixed, that were like, hey, here's the price and here's how long you're going to commit to it in a, a hardware model where you had very predictable, here's a piece of equipment, you buy that piece of equipment, okay, sale, next piece of equipment, sale. That has all shifted over time. And I think that it, the why has it shifted? I think it's shifted because the technology that we've had has evolved to allow for this consumption, this on-demand consumption type of basis. And it's a lot of things that feed into that. It's the public internet, it's computer technology, it's software advancements that we've had. They're enabling this type of thing. We started selling a few years ago services that used to be very fixed line, like uh, data connections. Somebody would buy a, a one gig circuit from us and we would say, well, the minimum term for that is one year. So here's your price for one year. And I remember when we started using this advanced technology, like software defined networking is another technology that advanced that uh, enabled us to provide this on demand. We had concerns. And I think like your company and a lot of other companies did at first, boy, I know that people would like to turn it up on demand and be able to turn it down when they don't want to use it anymore. But that's kind of scary. We could be getting revenue and then like the next day we could stop getting revenue. (laughs) I mean, I don't know what all went on in VMware or Microsoft's heads whenever, because I wasn't in those companies. But I know that in, in our companies, we looked at that. We were a little worried because the idea that, boy, are we really going to be able to predict demand and forecast demand and reliably customers could leave us so easily. Was that going to really hurt our business in the long term if we start offering products like that? But as we started offering products like that, I think that, and we started learning about consumer buying behavior, we were pleasantly surprised. And and it must be, you all must be, have been pleasantly surprised as well as others, because we have all been making this shift now. But we've been pleasantly surprised at how much that actually helps with revenue retention and with revenue growth, because customers feel much more comfortable it's that we lower the risk of their buying things because they know if it doesn't work out that they can immediately exit and stop using it and stop paying for it. It just makes us all better. We get better at delivery. We get better at the customer experience. It makes us focus on those things and it provides a better customer experience. And then by keeping that uh, good customer experience active, then they actually stay with us longer. And what we've seen is that when customers buy our dynamically consumable services that they don't have to sign up for any term for, they can disconnect and stop using them whenever they want. They actually stay with us and use it and grow it 
we know more than what they would have in the previous type of construct. And I think that that's why we're all moving to that kind of a model. Benefits both the customer and it benefits our companies and makes us all better is kind of a summary of how I'd say that. The other dimension of it that you mentioned is around the managed services wrapper. You know, why, why are customers looking to have things bought with a managed services component? And I think that it's because we're becoming a, just an increasingly complex technologies that have to interoperate with each other and have to be put together and integrated. So I know our enterprise customers are looking at this rapidly evolving world and they're saying, you know, if I got to make all of these decisions through the technology stack, I've got to have this big workforce. I got to have, I'm constantly having to think about, worry about things like the software upgrades, like the hardware upgrades. Is the applications that I'm going to run next week going to run on the processor that I bought two years ago? And you've got all these complexities that will drive enterprises to build out workforce and labor in areas that are not really value add to their businesses. And so what they do is that whenever companies like ours can come up with really good managed services wrappers that make sense, that meet that customer's need, that allow them to obfuscate the complexity and focus on the things that are really core to their business, then that's another situation where it's a winner for both. It's a winner for the customer because they can operate more efficiently because large companies like ours can do certain things more efficiently for the customer than they can do with their own in-house labor. And so we benefit because of the extra revenue stream opportunities, but the customers benefit because it lowers their operational costs by doing it. Got it. I love the perspective, Paul, that you shared as you were describing kind of the virtuous cycle as companies take the risk and start offering things more as a on a consumption basis. I think you're the first person who I've spoken to who has added the dimension of an effect that it reduces psychological risk with customers in terms of buying and therefore even creates deeper connection. So yes, we are spending a lot of time focusing on that. It is a key initiative and priority for VMware. And I know as being part of that transformation, it is forcing us to reshift our entire focus on the customer. Not that we weren't customer focused before, but as you know, we were focused on a different way. We need to focus all of the time and everything needs to be thinking about that. And I think leading with our partners as well. It's both together at the front seat of that. And I also really appreciate your description around the driver for managed service in terms of just managing massive complexity and allowing customers to focus on what is their core business differentiation versus managing that increasingly complex technology stack Further question on that for you, because what we're seeing, and particularly over the last year, and I want to shift and talk about how the last year has transformed and changed all of us, but our businesses as well, is increasingly VMware talks about focusing on our customers' digital transformations. And the digital transformation is not technology just to run the companies. It is the business. It is how our companies are engaging with their customers. And I think less and less... You can't differentiate a customer's, this is my technology infrastructure to run my business, and then there's the business. The technology is becoming the business. And in fact, companies' ability to differentiate themselves, respond to customers more quickly, is all supported by the technology, by the applications and application-centric view. So where do you see customers or companies drawing the line of kind of outsourcing management but still being owners of it because it is actually delivering and driving their company's business differentiation? Yeah, it's a really good question. In terms of drawing that line between the management of a company needing to making that decision about what they outsource and what they don't, I would like to first start just by saying that we're in a world now where managers need to be coming into the company with basically digital transformation in mind. There are tactical decisions about what you outsource what you buy as a managed service. But that doesn't mean that, okay, well, I'm just going to outsource that. And now I'm not going to have to be digitally savvy. I'm not going to have to think about how my company works in a digital world. That would be a recipe for disaster. I think that these decisions about managed services pieces are really more tactical things that business managers and IT organizations and technology organizations, where they specifically address a certain need, where they recognize that they can do this because of their scale more efficiently than I can do it with my in-house resources. That's not core to my business. This over the things are core to my business. This is what's going to differentiate my company going forward. So I'm going to outsource that piece. 
It doesn't mean that they don't have to worry about digital transformation anymore. This topic is actually very fresh in my mind because I work with the business school at the University of Denver. So I've been just trying to help them with some of their curriculum and they've been really great, but they're actually really thinking about this in terms of how do we prepare MBA students for the work world as they emerge? And how do we put together coursework that really make the leaders of the future think about this is a different environment. You have to understand, you have to be technology savvy. You have to understand the major movements that are happening because it affects every business. You shouldn't be graduating from business school these days thinking, well, I don't need to know anything about AI because that's what those engineers over there, that's all for them to do. I just need to know the numbers or how to do financial calculations. No, as a business manager, you have to understand these emerging back to the fourth industrial revolution technologies because it can apply in every single area of the business. AI is material to finance organizations as it is to the companies like ours that we're running networks or operating networks for customers. That's true even in the marketing function, right? So as a marketing leader, I've spent my life in marketing and B2B tech marketing. And increasingly, one of the biggest shifts we are seeing is how driven it is by technology. The MarTech stack is a major expense for us, but we need increasingly the talent to be able to know how to not just run it, but also use it, apply the insights, know how to make business decisions, know how to use it to guide, and it is the running of marketing. So I think your work with the University of Denver sounds fascinating. I think we could probably send a whole podcast talking about that whole topic. But I did want to shift and talk about talent because what we've seen over the last year is with the shift to remote work combined with what we've seen, the events of the last year have been a catalyst for the acceleration of digital transformation, shift to it and adoption of technology, which means that it is making talent that is knowledgeable about technology more in demand than ever. And yet the shift to remote work is removing barriers to people shifting to different jobs, moving to different locations, et cetera. How are you as a leader, both Lumen and how is Lumen thinking about both acquiring and nurturing and keeping your talent bench um, in light of a really, really hot talent market for tech. Yeah, I think it's really a double-edged sword because in some ways it's benefiting us. We were pretty much a 80% in-office workforce before COVID hit. And when COVID hit, we completely flipped. I mean, we went from 20% out of office to 80% out of office in the course of one week. We were so sure about that. We were all worried about it. And I was talking to the CEO of another company uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying the big flip happened and we were all worried that everybody was going to be off walking their dogs and not paying attention to the work. And then the exact opposite happened. Actually, now we can't get people to take vacations. We're worried about people being online too much and that studies have shown that people are working actually much more harder. The double-edged sword in this thing is that now it's easier for us to find talent and to and we feel comfortable with bringing talent in immediately and letting them work from home. I've interviewed a number of people since COVID has hit, and I hardly even thought to ask them the old interview question, so are you willing to move to Denver? Because I didn't even think about it anymore. I mean, it's like, it doesn't matter wherever you are. I don't even know where you live. I don't care. And so it's much easier to recruit talent and to get talent. But then it's also the, the flip side of that is it's also easier to lose talent and the talent drain that's happening there. So one of the things I know that we're doing is as things clear with COVID, we are starting our reentry plans and we looked across the whole organization and basically decided what roles really needed to be really in the office and which didn't. And in the end, we decided that there's not very many that really need to be in the office. And so part of our plan is we're giving our employees the flexibility to make that decision. You can't have employees say, oh, well, yeah, I want to be in the office, but then they only come in one day a week. That would be a kind of a waste. But we are going to give employees a choice because we think that that's going to help us with recruiting and with retention of employees and also job satisfaction. But in the end, what it boils down to is in keeping employees is around engagement and making sure that they feel like they've got a mission that they know that they can plug into and that they feel good about, regardless of whether they're working from home or working in the office. That's the key to this thing. That's great. And I think the topics that you shared, Paul, are all things we're wrestling with internal to VMware as well. As you were talking about giving people a choice, I've realized I have hired people onto my team that I've never met in person. 
my new boss, Carol Carpenter, is our chief marketing officer. I think I've met her once for five minutes and I've worked for her for a year. And we happen to live about 10 miles apart and still haven't had a chance to see each other. So it's just really challenged and shifted the way we engage on some ways more intimate than others as we see kids and cats and pets. And we saw your dogs going outside at the beginning of this, right? But at the same time, we're a little bit more distant. So it's going to be interesting. I love your word reentry as we all figure out how to navigate that over this year. But I, I agree, it's all around engagement and helping people feel they have the opportunity to deliver roles that deliver impact. And I agree, I think we all are working more I know that we need to manage those boundaries. But in that additional time over the last year, how have you been able to leverage that time either in picking up a hobby, re-embracing a hobby, learning something new, or how have you used that different time to enrich your life or explore a new aspect of your interest? Oh, I did some great mental thing. You know, I read a book a day or I did something crazy like that. But I get teased about this around the office or on the Zoom calls anyway. I kind of accidentally fell into this, but it's it's building Legos, okay? And I know it really? sounds incredibly childish, but the year before COVID hit, I remember flying home right before Christmas, and I looked on my phone to United Airlines, and they had, oh, see your flight summaries for the last year. And I had 55 trips on United through the year last year, and that wasn't the only carrier I flew. I went from that to zero over the last year. So my wife bought me the Millennium Falcon Lego set. And I'd only like put a plug a couple of Legos together with my kids or whatever at Christmas. And this thing is like the monster. It's got 7,500 pieces. And so I started just building that as something to do at night to relax after work. And what I did find was that it was actually very relaxing. You got a day, you're on Zoom calls, you're doing so much and you just sit down and you just start piece by piece. Every you see the progress. So yeah, over COVID, I built several pretty cool things and I have them in displays around different parts of the house. Like right now, my Millennium Falcon, my wife is mad at me because it's so big, there's no place to put it. So it's on our pool table downstairs. And she's really after me too. As soon as we get back in the office, she's like going, you know, get that thing out of the house and take it to the office to your, show it off to your friends or something because I don't want it on our pool table anymore. Oh, Paul, I love that. Actually, I'm thinking that would be a fabulous thing to do. And like you, I know sitting on we uh, Zoom calls all day, email, dealing with a lot of information and managing complex, challenging things in organizations. It is so refreshing to do something and make something that you can physically see. And frankly, you can get done across the, the finish line. So I love that idea. I would recommend, by the way, I know, I think they have the capability of special Lego glue to be able to glue the sets together. And I think that should be hanging from your office. I think you should got it, get it hanging from the office in the ceiling so that it's there and there's something definitely to be done there. But I love that. Paul, thank you so much for your time and speaking with us today. I've loved your insights about both leadership, how you've personally navigated the changes of the last year, learning so much more about Lumen, talking about the different trends we're seeing in technology and customers. I think there are a couple of comments there that we could have talked for and topics an hour each on just those, but it's been just delightful. Really appreciate your time and thank you so much. Well, thank you, Kathleen. I really enjoyed it. And we're back. I hope you enjoyed Paul's insights on the future of digital business and the dawning of the fourth industrial revolution and gained some new inspiration along the way. To learn more about Lumen, please visit lumen.com and to connect with Paul, you can find him on LinkedIn. Please subscribe, follow, and review VMware Partnership Perspectives from your streaming platform of choice. For more information on VMware's partner programs, please visit VMware Executive Edge at VMware.com. I'm Kathleen Tandy, your host of the VMware Partnership Perspectives. Thank you and see you next week.